There is an almost incomprehensibly beautiful painting that we have been showing you over the past few weeks. It's been the center of all the stories about the relationship between Republican megadonor Harlan Crow and Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. To me, this stunning image captures the real story. Not only are Thomas and Crow pictured here at Crow's luxurious Adirondack Resort, where this painting hangs, we also see Federalist Society co-chairman Leonard Leo, who the Washington Post reports directed tens of thousands of dollars of business to the firm of Ginny Thomas, at least that we know of, while keeping her name off billing paperwork, though NBC News has not independently verified that report. And then there's Mark Pauletta. He's the former general counsel for the Office of Management and Budget under Donald Trump and the lawyer for Ginny Thomas. He's also been writing defenses of this whole arrangement. That's Peter Rutledge, dean of the University of Georgia Law School. Now, the story of chumminess and, I'd argue, corruption told in this image is not tangential to the story of our current 6-3 conservative supermajority in the court and the Dobbs decision that struck down Roe v. Wade and the many other dangerous decisions that have already been issued and will be issued by this court. It is all one story. To understand that story, you got to start by viewing it from the perspective of some of the men in that photo, like Leonard Leo, conservatives like Leonard Leo. He's one of the most powerful people in conservative legal circles in this country. In fact, the most powerful. He's the architect of this court. And from Leo's perspective, here's how the last 50 years played out, all right? Listen to this. Since the 1970s, the court has had majorities of justices that were appointed by Republican presidents. The whole time, there was never a majority appointed by Democratic nominees, right? Yet despite this, the court refused to move as far to the right as activists like Leo and hardliners wanted it to. In some cases, quite famously, Republican-appointed justices became bedrock stalwart liberals, like the great Justice John Paul Stevens, to a somewhat lesser extent, David Souter. Then in other cases, Republican appointees moved back and forth, but drifted to the middle on really key issues like abortion and gay rights, Justices Sandra Day O'Connor and Anthony Kennedy. I mean, when Planned Parenthood v. Casey came to the court in 1992, those two justices, Kennedy and O'Connor, both appointed by Reagan, ruled to uphold the protections in Roe. And all of this was, to men like Leo and his cohort, an unfathomable betrayal and an outrage. And, you know, it, it's not crazy they felt that way. I mean, think about how it would feel if last June in the Dobbs decision, Justice Sonia Sotomayor had joined the majority in striking down abortion rights. Liberals would have lost their minds. And that's what it felt like for a lot of Republicans. So that was the problem they had, right? Justice after justice being appointed by Republican nominees and then not voting the way they wanted to. They would put people on the court, but then they couldn't control how they ruled. And what good was the power of getting justices on the bench if they just went liberal on you? Now, I think they came to understand that they had a problem to solve. And there were two sort of components of that problem. The first was they weren't vetting their conservative justices enough to ensure that they were only selecting the most dyed-in-the-wool true believers. And then secondly, once they were on the court, they were losing them to other influences. They seemed to drift away from their previous hard-right positions. Now, it is my personal opinion this was likely the result of the realities of judging, not to mention the insufficiencies of right-wing legal dogma. For someone like Leo, he had to come up with a solution. They all did. And I think he came up with a twofold solution. You can see it in his actions. First, make sure there is a mechanism for vetting true believers. And I mean early on, a farm system from all the way down. He is the co-chairman of the Federal Society, which cultivates, nurtures, selects young people starting in their first year of law school in the first week of law school, and then nurtures them through law school and then to clerkships, and then jobs in politics, and helping them become Supreme Court clerks, which is the most important job for a young conservative or any young lawyer, and then nominees for ju being judges themselves. And once they are positioned properly, right, then this is the second part of the solution. You gotta make sure that you keep them contained in this world so they do not drift away from right-wing <laughs> beliefs. Well, how do you achieve that? Well, you create a whole universe of conservative think tanks and get-togethers and conferences and donor relationships to surround these justices. Like, I don't know, a summer retreat at Harlan Crow's resort, resort where they enjoy luxury accommodations, fresh air, and some cigars with right-wing ideologues. I know this sounds a little conspiratorial, but here's a description given to the New York Times by one of the few people who was part of this overall effort who then subsequently left it. 
I'll quote him here, quote, former anti-abortion leader Reverend Rob Shank recruited wealthy donors, encouraging them to invite some of the justices to meals, to their vacation homes, or to private clubs. He advised allies to contribute money to the Supreme Court Historical Society, sort of random, obscure nonprofit, and then mingle with justices at its functions. He ingratiated himself with court officials who could help give him access record show. Mr. Shank said his aim was not to change minds, but rather to stiffen the resolve of the court's conservatives in taking uncompromising stances that could eventually lead to a reversal of Roe. See, the thing is, Leo, and I think other conservatives, have a mental model in which liberalism is this kind of conspiratorial indoctrination, hatched in back rooms to brainwash people, as opposed to what I think it is, a complicated, emergent cultural phenomenon of an open society. But conservatives take that false model of, like, men with literally cigars sitting around a table deciding how to control cultural institutions, and then they explicitly adopt it as their own. Again, don't take my word for it. Listen to a video of Leonard Lee Hill himself, who's now raised billions from right-wing billionaires, talking about his plans to use a strategy he helped for the court to spread conservatism to other parts of society as part of a private organization Leo co-chairs called Teneo. I spent close to 30 years, if, if not more, helping to build the conservative legal movement. And at some point or another, you know, I just said to myself, well, if this can work for law, why can't it work for lots of other areas of American culture and American life where things are really messed up right now? Wokeism in the corporate environment, in the educational environment one-sided journalism, entertainment that's really corrupting our youth. Why can't we build talent pipelines and networks that can positively affect those areas as well? Talent pipelines and networks. What do you think Harlan Crow and Leonard Leo and their conservative buddies talk about with the justice and the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, all of them hang out? After Crow has taken Thomas on a trip on his private jet or bought the house Thomas' mother was living in or paid, pri paid private school tuition for the child Thomas was raising, what do you think they talk about? Who are we kidding here? What about the Washington Post report, which NBC has not verified, about Leonard Leo directing business fees to Ginny Thomas? Do you think the Thomas family simply had no idea where that money was coming from? This is fundamentally what the conservative session has been about. It explains, among other things, why this court, the 6-3 Dobbs court, is in such a rush to overturn precedent as fast as they can. The first chance they got in this new conservative court, they overturned Roe. And it's not hard to imagine that part of that rush stems from the desire to execute this judicial revolution before any of the justices potentially change their mind or drift as previous justices have. What we have now embodied in that image is the kind of captured court that Leo, Leonard Leo has worked towards for years. You can see it all laid bare right there in a single picture.